All right. Should be up here. Hi to everybody out there. This is going to be kind of an interesting one today. Hi to everybody out there. So give it a few minutes here just to make sure everybody's in and it's going to be watching. Um, of course, a lot of people will, will be watching this later on. Um, today we're going to talk about recycled housing. Okay. Um, and I have this picture up here for a reason. Because what we were doing years ago, um, when we moved down to our property, we were really going over the thing of what should we build, where should we build, the whole deal. And we just wanted to get down to our our land, and and we just wanted to be there and say, okay, we're here, you know, and whatever. And so I said, you know, I was trying to think of what could we live in and, and whatever else because we've experimented with a lot of things over the years. And the thought occurred to me, this old logging picture, I had a bunch of books from the old logging days, and these people would make – temporary houses out of stumps from the big trees that, that uh, were cut down. And that's what you're seeing here, this picture. Um, this, You can see this thing here. These guys are, are made this house into a, or made this old tree stump into a house. And there's quite a few pictures of that. Um, people did that. And I said, um, I said, question to my wife. I said, would you be willing to live in a stump for a while while building? And she kind of thought, huh? <laughs> And uh, and I explained it to her, and she said, "Okay, I see what you're saying." And, and I said, "You know, a stump is not does not have to be permanent. It's temporary living while you're building things and, and doing things." And so after I had explained it like that, then it was, oh, "Okay, I I got you." You know. Um. So, just kind of our little we actually call our tiny home our stump because it's just a temporary thing. It's not where, where we will be living for the rest of our lives. So kind of an interesting way to say it. Um, but that's what we're going to basically be talking about today. I just wanted to get this as a concept out there that uh, stump living is living in things that are recycled. Obviously, this tree here uh, was used by a lumber mill. They, they cut it down. These little grooves right here that these things are are for the springboards that you notch in there with your axe and then you put the board in there because you don't want to cut a tree these big trees with all the root swell coming out the grain's not that, that great down there and it's harder to skid it if it's really flared out at the base so they would put their springboards in and then they would actually fell the tree up a lot higher is what they would do to get the straighter grain of the higher up on the stump there and so they leave these huge big stumps behind and they thought well oh, just carve it out a little bit and we'll have a decent little house so definitely a solid wood house um so uh, but what we're, what we're going to talk today about like i said is the thing of recycled housing okay now i'm going to go over a couple different types of recycled housing um in other words housing that's not an actual house with a foundation and everything else it's something that you can get it used you can get it very cheap. Oftentimes, this is, you know, today I'm really going to be showing you ways to save money for people to say, I don't have much money. I'd like to go off grid, but I don't have much money. How on earth will I build a place? Well, the stump concept, the recycled housing concept. First and foremost, um, we would have a motor home. Okay. Um, I'll show you what I mean by that. Different types of things. Here's some more pictures. If you just do a Google image search of different people living in stumps, uh, a lot of different ones out there. But um, motorhome, what do you have there? You have three different classes of motorhomes. You have class A, which is sort of like the big bus look like that. Class B is sort of a van with a camper top on it or is, you know, some camper type of things in the back. The, the rear seats fold down into a bed and there might be a little sink and a little propane stove or whatever. But. This would be the smallest of the three. And then um, 
Class C would be the one that has sort of the truck front to it, and then it has the over the cab little sleeping loft area like that. And I know it really doesn't make much sense. You'd think it'd be A, and then this should be B, and then the smallest should be C, or something like that. But this is how they're classified. I have no idea why. But then, of course, you have um, travel trailers like this right here travel trailers, fifth wheels, toy haulers, hybrids all these different type of things. Now, these are possibilities for people that want to move off grid, and there are certainly people that have moved them off grid, and they work. They, they do work, but there's some problems with them. Okay, first and foremost, if you have a motorhome, one that's actually, you know, this class down in here, um, you have your living space attached to something that has fuel in it. Be it diesel or gas. Well, that's obviously a fire hazard. Um, and you can see that, yes, they do burn. Uh, they can catch on fire, including, you know, here's even one that's a sort of a fifth wheel trailer there. And you can see that it's caught on fire. And it's burning pretty good there. But a lot of these, what happens is these diesel pushers, they call them, uh, right there, you can see that uh, they have the motor in the back. Well, that kind of works for if you have, you know, if you know any, anything about an old VW Beetle, they had the motor in the back, and the old Porsches did as well back in the 60s and 70s. But they're air-cooled, and there's a lot of, you know, they're small little vehicles. But you get something that's huge like this, especially you start going up hills, and this is a liquid-cooled motor back here. Well, it's not going to get a lot of air going to that radiator. It's going to overheat, and then it can start a fire like this. And you have a problem. Again, you know, you look at some of these motorhomes like that. That's that's a a big issue. If you if all of your living stuff is in there, it's literally going to go up in smoke. And you say, well, what if I drive it to some place and park it? Well, that would work. And certainly, okay, fine. That works for some people. I mean, it doesn't happen to everybody's motorhome. I get that. But the the risk is always there. Okay. The other issue with these things is um, they're very cheap construction. Motorhomes are, you know, incredibly cheap in their construction because they have to be. They have to be very lightweight to be able to move down the road. And you take, you know, one of these things, these travel trailers, they're very flimsy. The walls are very thin. Um, they don't have a whole lot of, of uh, insulation value or anything else. The roofs, at some point in time, they will leak in travel trailers. Every travel trailer I've ever seen, the roofs will leak. A lot of them, that's just there's wood underneath for the floor, and the, the water, if you're driving it while it's raining or whatever else, the water's going up underneath. I mean, I've been to used RV places where it'll start to rot the floor. I've been to used RV places where you literally walk into a motorhome and you can feel, you know, you're going to step on the floor, it's kind of Oh, okay. It feels like my foot's going to go through that rotted spot on the floor. They, the roof will leak, the floor will leak. Period. That's the way it is with these motorhomes, um, or travel trailers, I should say. Um, that's another problem. Uh, they're made out of com almost completely synthetic materials. Well, again, as an off-gridder, um, if you're health conscious at all, you want to build with sort of um, green building materials, natural materials, so you're not getting all the, you know, off-gassing from the, the plastics and synthetics and formaldehyde from, you know, a lot of the insulation and everything else. So, again, stump concept, okay, it's temporary. We can do this thing for a little while while building our log cabin or whatever else. Okay, not a problem. Um, and you can get these things for fairly cheap. I should probably get rid of that picture there. <laughs> because it's you know, kind of discouraging to people, I guess. I've seen all these places in fire, but it can happen if you're connected to uh, propane and whatever else. Um, but the other issue that I have with uh, any kind of thing up in here, travel trailers, fifth wheels, motorhomes, it looks like you're living in it. So if you just want to kind of stay a little bit off the radar, and you park some big travel trailer back in there on your property, well, people are going to go by and say, somebody's living in that thing. And so there's 
other ways that you can live off grid and people won't be as quick to suspect that anything's going on there if you have to do it that way. Okay, which brings me to my next one here. That is a school bus conversion. Okay, um, there are a lot of people that do these. They call, call them schoolies. Right? You can live in this in a school bus. There's a picture of one. It's, I mean, pretty amazing. Some of the people really put some time and effort into these things. And there's one right there. And, you know, pretty amazing. Um, there's another one like that. You can fix them up pretty nice. I mean, there's videos on YouTube. People fix up these school buses. And, um, you know, it works. Uh, there again, you're having your living space connected to fuel. So that's iffy. Um, the other problem is school buses are not very tall inside. Uh, that's another big issue. Um, we have two school buses on our property and both used for storage. And uh, we actually originally had used one for as a kitchen. I did a video. I showed it behind me. And I said, sorry, we call it the scooching. And it worked. But the problem is I'm six foot three and my head kind of scrapes the middle, you know, the very highest point of the interior of the school bus when I'm walking. So most times I'm walking like this along. Well, there's no room to put insulation. I mean, you see this place, this school bus right here, they put this wood looking stuff in there. I don't know if that's real wood or just laminate flooring that they put up there. But they, you know, they build it down enough that they put these little LED lights in there and whatever that they can put a little bit of foam insulation in there to, to increase the R value. Um, okay, but then you're losing another two inches or so of space up there. Uh, I can't, you know, it doesn't work for me because it'd be way too low. Now, there are some people that actually do cut them and they raise the one part of the school bus up to give you a little bit more headroom, but then you get into issues with driving it down the road and is it legal? And if you're going to be driving around in the thing, well, you have to be careful about that. All right. Um, but they work. They're okay. And just the standard school bus, you know, you have, if you see this, all these windows along here, um, they do actually work pretty good for passive solar heat. In other words, um, you can heat them pretty well with just on a nice sunny day, those single pane windows will really have a lot of heat come in. And I mean, there's times we'll go, you know, hike over, you know, to one of our old school buses and in the winter, it'll be 20 degrees warmer inside than it is outside. So that's good, but that requires sunlight has to be a sunny day and the single pane windows yes they let heat in on a sunny day but they also let heat out on a cold night so again another thing to think about the flooring in the school buses also is a very it's not very thick plywood and it has just a sheet of rubber over top of it so again you're not dealing with a whole lot of insulation in that floor if you want to start looking at insulating these school buses to drive around. If, again, if you're parked someplace, you might be able to make it work. But if you're driving it around, you can't put a whole lot of weight in that school bus. There are issues with that. Um, but I mean, in the wintertime, we, we were cooking out in our school bus. Um, it was downright miserable standing on that floor. I mean, it was so cold. It was really bad. Even with a wood cook stove going full blast, it was still it wouldn't come even close to warming it up in there. Um, warmer than outside, but not warm enough that we really wanted to sit there and eat a meal. It was bad, you know, even with our coats on and everything else. And we're fairly tough when it comes to being able to handle the cold. So um, again, uh, would it work for you in your particular situation? If you're down south, perhaps, maybe. Um, I don't know. And they are cheap. That's another thing. Um, we paid 2000 for one of ours and 2500 for the other one. The $2,500 one, the difference between the two was that the one that was a little bit more money, $500 more, it actually ran. And so I actually drove it down. The first one we had a, a big wrecker. The guy I bought it from was a garage, and he had a big wrecker, and he pulled it down and dropped it on my property, and that was it. The other one, I actually drove it down. Um, got in, put some license plates on it just to transport it down, and I'm there driving a school bus, and and that was Oliver's uh, only experience riding on a school bus. So 
he was excited about that. <laughs> Had the school bus all to himself. Um, so they are low cost. The next option for recycled homes would be, go sit down, please. Um, the next option for recycled homes would be a conics box or a the shipping container box. Um, that's another one that you can do if you're looking for something fairly cheap. Um, you can get those anywhere from four to eight thousand dollars, depending on what you're getting. And they're very tough, they're very strong. Um, you know, you can see some of the, the things here. Uh, living big in a tiny house, you can see that they used multiple shipping containers, stuck them together, and you're cutting, you know, holes out of them and all this other stuff. They work. Um, there's another one there. And again, you know, creativity. You can be very creative with these things and, and whatever. Um, some of them get pretty dented and things, and they're cheaper to buy them that way and whatever. But there's a couple problems with them. Okay, first and foremost, they have sort of that corrugated wall there. It's kind of, it's not a flat wall on the inside and on the, on the outside, which presents a little bit of a challenge for insulating, insulating it um, properly. I mean, there's ways to do it, of course, but you're, again, you're going to, when you insulate the walls, you're going to lose a little bit of living space on the inside. And, you know, you start getting below eight feet wide in terms of living, it gets a little cramped feeling. All right. Um, the other thing is condensation problems. You have a metal box there. Metal, if it gets hot and then cold, hot and cold, it can create condensation on the inside. Moisture starts to build up. That's another problem with it. Uh, another problem is it's a fixed structure. There's no wheels underneath it. So again, if you remember what I said about, I think in the legal issues one, where I talked about, you know, if whatever you put on your land is a fixed structure, you might get in more trouble with that, with your local zoning planning commission type of a thing. Like, you know, up here, like I said, you get into a remote area, they really don't care what you do. Um, they're very nice people and things out in country areas. Um, but depending on where you're at, they might balk at the idea of you having shipping containers put together in, into a home because it looks like it's a fixed structure. And this one definitely has, it's either concrete block or I can't tell or concrete poured piers, which would definitely be a considered a fixed structure. Um, but again, another benefit of them is they're fairly cheap. As I discussed earlier, uh, under $10,000, certainly you could get a shipping container and start putting money into the thing to fix it up. Okay. Next option. And this is one that's not very um, popular, but it's uh, it works. There's some good things about it, which I'll talk about. Reefer trailer. You say, what is a reefer trailer? A reefer trailer is a trailer, semi-trailer, that has a refrigeration unit on it, like I'm pointing at right there. So we get a little bit bigger picture right there. Okay, so what happens is you can buy these reefer trailers, again, for about the same price, maybe a little bit more than the Conics box. But then what you get is you get something that can be, you know, trailered to your property. They drop it off. Um, and then this unit right here, they'll take that off or whatever else. You don't really want to buy it with that big thing on the front of that. I mean, you can, but we take it off and then you have a big hole here in the end of the thing. And you have to cover that over with plywood or whatever else that you want to do. Um Reefer trailers, as opposed to regular semi-enclosed trailers, semi-enclosed trailers have no insulation in them at all. They're designed to be lightweight. You put the weight in there and go down the road. Reefer trailers, on the other hand, actually have uh, the um, closed cell foam inside, about two inches of that. And it's, I think it's six and a half R value per inch of that foam. So it's about R13 which is a little bit less than what you would have in a regular standard home. That's usually about R15 to R18 um, insulation value. Okay. So um, the other issue is two inch thick walls are, you know, not the best in terms of security or whatever else. And, um, you know, it's, they're two inch thick walls, you know, it's, and it's a little sheet of aluminum here on the outside. 
then you have the foam and on the inside it's sort of a fiberglass sheet and um you know and we have, that's what our tiny house is made out of and um it's an old reefer trailer 53 foot reefer trailer and last night we got a really bad windstorm we get them frequently up on the mountain where we're at and you know you can literally feel the the wall you know like if you're sitting like this with your back against the wall in a chair you can feel the wall pushing <laughs> it's kind of the whole thing just kind of you know back and forth now you know i mean they're going down the highway with them like that picture right there you know guys going along you know 80 miles an hour 90 miles an hour down the highway so they can take a lot of shear forces and wind and everything else they can take that but you know it's not really confidence inspiring when your whole place is just moving back and forth and whatever but that's our stump okay temporary living um the other issue is because you have these little wimpy walls there's not a whole lot to attach to there so you can't just screw into the you know eighth inch of fiberglass sheet and two inches of foam there's no nothing to anchor into so what you have to do is you actually have to um build walls i mean i guess you can drill from the outside and go in that way and caulk it and whatever else to avoid leaking but the way i did it is i actually built self-supporting walls that are just screwed into the floor and not into the walls or into the ceiling they're just completely self-supporting so i don't i have one wall like this and then i have another wall and they attach together so they're just like a big box sitting in there and they hold each other together um just trying to think here if i can let me look up something really quickly here i do have some video that i've done inside um our tiny home um see if i can look that up real quick here okay I'll put this up on the screen here Okay. All right, you can see right there. Let me expand this, make it bigger. You can see right there, there's the wall of the reefer right there and right there and over here. So that's the width of the tiny home right there to there. This, you know, that's a mule deer right there. I'm I'm excuse me, doing the wrong screen. Um this is a mule deer. It was given to me by my older brother. I'm not, you know, secretly a Baphomet worshiper or something. You know, we hang our socks on that, our wet socks or wet gloves or whatever to keep it, you know, it's because our wood stove's right in this area here. So don't get excited. I'm, you know, people got all upset at me in that video. But, um, but like I was saying, right here is the one wall of the reefer, and right there is the other wall right there. So that's the width of our tiny house. Yes, it is a tiny house. And um, there's a little bathroom. And here you go around the corner there, right around this corner. And then Oliver's room is up in here. And the all the walls are self-supporting. They're only screwed in, down to the ground. So there's no connection in here. You can see up here there's a board like that that goes over to the shelving thing right here where we keep a lot of our stuff that we're, you know, our, our food and our spices and whatever else we put on there. Um, so real fancy you know but this is the one angle of it and i've done other videos where you can see um other angles of it but that's that's showing how i built the thing um the see what i have here you know again like i said it's got wheels underneath it so technically you know it's movable it's not a fixed structure um the other thing about it that's really good about a reefer a uh, tiny house is that they have a huge gross vehicle weight rating. Okay, that's I think ours is uh, about 32 tons that it can the total weight of the trailer and what it can haul in it. So you really don't uh, you really don't need any kind of oh we have to really you know support the floor or whatever else you know no it's it can handle a huge amount of weight. Um, a, you know more than we could possibly you know put in it um we used, we used to keep all of our books you know we had another one of our trailers we actually had all of our library
And um, so that's one of the good things about reefer trailers. Uh, the other thing, like I said, is that it has flat walls. So it's not like the corrugated wall of the Conex box. Um, the problem is you, you say, well, then there's no condensation. Well, unfortunately, yes, there is. Because if you look at this one here, you can see down along the bottom, they have this strip of aluminum like that, um, that is there for, you know, the forklift. So you don't gouge out the, you know, the cheap little thin fiberglass sheeting. And so you can go down through there and, and you know, you'll see these things are all dented up. Ours are dented up terribly. But what happens is you have two inches of material between the outside aluminum the foam two inch and then this inside aluminum but when it gets really cold the cold goes right through there and it starts to condensate and you can actually this will have ice on it it'll actually freeze up so that does have a problem with condensation and we actually ruined a a really beautiful wool rug that we had that we've had for many years unfortunately it was it was kind of it was too big to fit into the tiny home thing into our stump so I had it folded up on the one side, not understanding that the this metal sheeting thing here was going to, you know, condensate, and so it was it was pulling moisture in, and eventually got moldy. The, you know, the wool rug, and we had to get rid of it because there was no way to fix it, which was really upsetting. So um, the other thing that's nice about these things is that they have a nine foot ceiling. It's nine feet from here on the floor the whole way up to there so one of these reefer trailers they have a, a really big it goes way up ours didn't have these metal you know strip things on it like that there's things that you can click things into to keep your load from shifting we didn't have that it was just plain walls but it's nine feet this way and uh and about it's a little bit over eight feet wide and on the outside, it's, you know, I think it's eight feet, six inches on the outside dimension. So it's a little bit wider. And then it's 53 feet long. So you see these people and they'll say, you know, I live in a 20 foot tiny house or 24 foot or 30 foot or whatever else. Um, but these things are 53 feet long. So you have a little bit more room to do things. But then you have people with tiny houses and they can oftentimes build these really high ceilings or lofts up top or whatever else, which you can't because then. The height of the semi trailer is already, I think, 13 feet 6 inches or something like that. So you can't really go any higher with a reefer trailer. Um, the other benefit of them, I'll say this, is that they have the metal, the roof up top is one solid sheet of metal. So there's no seams or anything else. Um, although we found, <laughs> um, we found that up in the front corner, uh it actually will if you have too much snow up there it'll actually create like an ice damming thing where it'll the the water doesn't run off the front of the trailer anymore it kind of goes and finds its way down in behind the one light up top and then it leaks on down on the inside of the trailer so fun times but um you can cut you know holes through these things put windows in them put doors in them which we've done and uh it works and again they're fairly cheap uh, you can get them, you know, without spending a, a huge amount of money. So, okay, what is this all about here? Sorry, I have to get rid of a uh, troll. But just seeing something, okay, I don't know what's going on over there. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so there's that. Uh, another, so I think I've covered everything about the reefer trailer. If anybody has any questions, you can ask me here in a few minutes when I'm done with this. Going over it, I have one more category to go over. But, um, you know, pros and cons definitely of this. And we have spent, you know, three winters now in this thing. And heat is never a problem. I mean, we can get by with barely any firewood. Uh, it's they're very easy to heat, even at 30 below zero Fahrenheit, and um, you know it works works very well. A lot of times it's just we 
literally will start a fire in the morning, cook our breakfast, and then start a fire in the evening when we come home and cook our evening meal. And that's it. So uh, works quite well. A lot of people are having problems with, you know, I heard this morning that 20% uh, of Americans can no longer afford utilities um, to keep electric on, to keep heat in their homes, the, the oil, heat, and whatever else. And I just think, wow, that's bad. And um, by the way, everything in here that you're seeing in terms of the lighting, that's all with our off-grid lighting. Okay, there's no, I'm not running a generator secretly outside and whatever else with nice lights and things. Um, it's all completely um, off-grid lighting, which I'll talk about in another part of the seminar. So final thing here, other options besides what I've already mentioned. Um, well, one of them would be a campulance, okay? An ambulance that you can camp in, okay? You can see some of those right here. There's one, you can see they put a little bed in the back and things, and the ambulances, we have one bought, one used. You can get them, you know, pretty cheap, and they have all kinds of storage. I mean, on the inside, they have stuff on the outside, all the different compartments and everything, it's all stainless steel. I mean, these ambulances are really expensive, brand new, and they're built very well. They're a lot stronger in terms of the building uh, strength than, <laughs> than these things, the different types of motorhomes. Ambulances are designed that they can take a rollover and it doesn't destroy them. Um, so, you know, again, we have experience with that. Uh, we've, uh, you know, there's a lot of, Good things to say about them and they're actually pretty fast too because they're an emergency response vehicle so they don't make them to be just this doggy thing that just takes forever to get up a hill you can go pretty quick in these ambulances um and there's all kinds of neat things too i mean i heard the one time i was looking into the subject and the guy said literally there was uh he bought one that actually had a switch that could make uh stop lights turn from red to green and he said not supposed to use it but he said it I'll just say it this way. It does work. <laughs> I thought that was pretty interesting. We don't have that feature on ours, though. So, but we do have a siren, which you're not supposed to use. Um, but again, state laws there could be interesting. But you say, why bring this up? Well, if you're just starting out and you're saying we might need to bug out and soon, um, look for a used ambulance. Sometimes the, the, your local town might be getting rid of one and they put it up for auction, just like a sealed bid auction. You know, I've heard people picking these things up for $1,000, $1,500 through a sealed bid auction. And you just take the thing, you know, make sure that the brakes are, you know, good on it and check out the motor and everything else and have a mechanic just kind of go over everything and, and make sure it's all working well. And then you can just go in and start taking out a lot of the medical stuff and, you know, like the, you know, like this they did here you know you can you don't want the gurney in there or whatever and, uh you know take that out take out some of the other oxygen tank type of stuff and whatever and you can make it pretty decent actually and uh i mean we did four thousand mile trip in one so and it had no problems at all uh i see one of your comments there what about the gas mileage well um most of them are going to be diesel um, I know you're just saying fuel mileage is what you're saying. And surprisingly, they're not that bad. They really aren't. Um, they have big tanks in them. So, you know, I mean, you aren't going to go totally broke or whatever. Um, the one problem with them is that they, because there's so many lights hooked up to them and so many electronic things, um, unless you're really, a, uh, really good at that, you can disconnect a lot of that stuff. But I've never been able to figure it all out. So I just leave most of my stuff connected. But then the problem is there's a lot of parasitic battery draw type of things. So most ambulance crews, they just keep them plugged in at the building, wherever they're at, at the fire hall or wherever. Um, and if you don't do that, a lot of times the batteries will drain. And uh, we've had a problem with that. But I just I put a solar panel on top of the our ambulance and it keeps the battery charged. Usually <laughs> most of the time when there's you know, as long as their sun is out, you know, the sun's out and shining, then we have no problem starting it. So, in the, and uh, so another thing to think about. Another one, not going to show a picture, but a, a box truck, uh, you know, like if you can imagine a, a U-Haul truck or something like that, or a, 
I know that um, snap-on tools trucks. I saw a guy had made one of those into a tiny home. Um, you can do that. A van, a regular just van that you can get, one-ton van or smaller. People, you know, convert those into a place to live, a place to go around. And again, again, remember the concept here: recycled housing. It's a stump. It's temporary. So you get things, you know, to where you can really make sense of it. Okay. Cars and trucks. Again, I've seen guys with, you know, trucks and they, they fix up the trucks, truck bed. They put a, a cap on it or a canopy, wherever you're from there. They, you know, some people call it a canopy, but you put the thing on the bed and you can sleep in there. I've done that on a camping trip. The one time a friend of mine and I went up to a mountainous area and we we're up there fishing and kayaking and things and, and I slept in the back of my truck bed he slept out on the ground in his sleeping bag um, temporary temporary living so um, I think that pretty much covers it in terms of everything that I wanted to say I'll put that picture up again we can go over some different questions now I guess if anybody has any questions, I kind of went through it pretty quickly there, but there's a lot of different ideas for temporary living, for cheap, low-cost living, um, because it, I know it gets really daunting when you think about the off-grid thing. It's, it's a whole different lifestyle, and it is, and you just think, how in the world could I ever do it? It's just not possible. I don't have much money and whatever. I don't have much money, All right? Um, and, you know, if you're willing, again, remember the 90%. 90% up here, 10% here. If you're willing to think, hey, you know what? I'd rather live in a stump. I'd rather live in this right here than a city apartment with neighbors that are listening to rock music and you know all the other stuff. Um, something to think about. Okay. So um, we'll put up some things here. Question, do you agree a hoodie is good for hot? I guess, are you trying to say hot climates, I think? Um, you know, I guess some people would say yes to that. I don't really, I'm not really into the hood thing very much. Um, how does the bathing showering situation work for off-grid housing, especially in colder climates? Um, we'll be covering that in another seminar uh, coming up. Um, the thing of off-grid off hygiene and laundry. I will be covering that. Uh, and, and by the way, anybody else out there that has a question, if you're new to how I do things here, what he has done here with the, you know, it says question in capital letters. That way I can see it quicker. Um, Brother Brian, I live in Michigan, and we don't have car inspections to keep cars on the road. Does Maine do that? If so, is it is is it a bad as bad as people make it out to be. Um, Maine does not do that. Unfortunately, Maine is, we could really split off into two different states. <laughs> the, the state of North Maine and the state of Southern Maine. Um, Southern Maine, Southern Mainers are liberal city people. Northern Mainers are conservative country people. So unfortunately, the Southern Mainers are the ones that make the laws for the state. So Yes, we do have vehicle inspection here, unfortunately. Um, a lot of people don't pay attention to it, quite frankly. Um, I know of quite a few people. I saw an older man at a gas station uh, just a few days ago. He was behind me um, pumping gas into his vehicle um, in the town of Holton, which is a, you know, they actually have a, a state police barracks there in Holton. And he's, this guy's pumping gas in his truck, and he has a big crack across his windshield. You know, from one side to the other, no inspection sticker. <laughs> I mean, not even one that's outdated. He had none. And it was not a classic truck. So um, a lot of people just don't care about the, the laws and things. Um, uh, question, do you have any videos on dietary laws or the lack thereof? Uh, no, I don't. Um, uh, 
question. I was saying schoolie is good for hot climates. Look what is available based on where you are living and what you uh, your budget can afford. Yeah, schoolies are, are definitely better for hotter climates. Um, I actually knew one of my neighbors, um, he was telling me that there's a older man in the area here and he said he actually had five uh, school buses and they were kind of parked end to end that, you know, this one's going, that one's going this way, this one's going that way. And he just kind of cut holes in between and he could just walk in between all the different school buses. And um, so you, you get creative, get creative. You know, this, this is creativity right here. And they have, they have a wood stove in that thing that's going up through the roof there. These are just old uh, cedar shakes probably that they split out by hand, you know, put a little window in back there, a nice little place to put potted plants or just lean there or whatever. Get creative with things. So does anybody else have any other questions? Did I cover everything? I hope. Actually, the next, uh, seminar which will be tomorrow will be on the thing of um, laundry and hygiene so to the guy earlier that asked yeah i'll be talking about that tomorrow and again you know the thing of recycle you know don't go out and buy a brand new school bus to make a schoolie out of it don't go buy a brand new reefer trailer they're very expensive um, don't go buy a brand new conix box get things that are used and fix them up uh, it's a low-cost way to do it and I mean again this is a, a thing for people that say oh, I just can't afford to go off-grid and whatever yes you can question what do you think of Kent Hovind's adventure land it seems to have a lot of off-grid aspects I've never been there I I don't really know much about it um, there's a lot of issues with Ken Hovind, um, doctrinal issues, and a lot of other things that are not good with that guy. I, I stay away from him. So it's a shame. I really highly respected him for a while, but he really went off the deep end doctrinally and things. So, um, Question, best place to start learning how to build as a city person? Um, first and foremost, I would say, uh, you can watch some videos on YouTube. It's a good thing. Start getting your mind thinking that direction. And if you can get something like a van or something smaller, I realize you couldn't park a 53-foot trailer in front of your place. And I saw somebody else earlier, by the way, they said, well, you'd have to have a truck bring it because you can't pull one behind a pickup truck. That's true. Um, you, know, you would have to find a, somebody who has a tractor trailer that could haul the reefer trailer to your property or whatever. But for you... If you could start out building, say, a van or something like that, like an adventure van. Um, I mean, I saw the one time we were coming up the Interstate 95, heading back up home here from being down in southern Maine, and I saw a guy that had a van, and it was from California. And he was, you know, traveling the country. Great. Smart thing to do. So start out building an interior of a van, something small. and. Um, Go up from there. Hi, Brian. Unrelated to the topic, I've been wondering about other epistles besides Paul's, such as Peter's and John's. Are they doctrinally for us today or pointed to the time of Jacob's trouble like James and Hebrews? That's an, an issue. Can't get really into that today. I mean, it's it's something that there's a lot within there that's sort of kind of in between <laughs> um, that it can be for us or for them. Uh, you just have to, you know, go through it and See what you can find with it. Um, and comparing scripture with scripture, I'm saying. Um, uh, question, not sure if you already said, but how is the temperature in a campulence in winter? Do they get too cold if you have to stay in one temporarily? Um, I never stayed in one through the winter. We have ours at our property, and... Um, I would put some kind of like a little small wood stove in it or something. I mean, really small. You can get, um, you can get some really tiny little wood stoves. I mean, you can pick them up and everything. Uh, they're really small, and it'd be fairly easy to heat it. I mean, again, remember the thing, the stump concept. Okay, over here again. 
Remember the stump concept, keep it small. Small and simple is what you want to look for when you're going off grid. Um, are recycled homes sturdy or does it depend on the materials? Yeah, it depends on the materials. Uh, a travel trailer, not really sturdy. A, you know, um, reefer trailer that has a gross vehicle weight of, you know, 32 tons. Yeah, very sturdy. Um, although when the, the wind, you know, blows the walls around it, Connex box would be, you know, pretty much like a fortress. Um, what is the advantage of a schoolie cost? They're cheap. Um, question, I'm currently a student in college, almost done, but in debt, and these seminars interest me, but is it practical for someone in student debt to pursue off-grid housing? Well, um, if you can find some people that you could stay on their land or whatever in exchange for work or you have some relatives or whatever else, you can start out with a tiny home. You can build a van, you know, and just live in that for a while or a campulence or some other kind of a thing, a smaller thing, and then eventually try to, you know, pay off your student loan debt and then get to a point where you can afford to buy land and then you can go out there and you can stay on your land in your vehicle that'd be my suggestion any advice for a family of seven going off grid in tiny housing um pretty much what i was saying i mean just you want to start out i mean you know there's pictures let me see if i can get those pictures back here of uh you know there's a family now it's only three children and a mother there and the father's probably taking the photo or whatever but there were you know look at some of the ways that early people lived it's kind of a colorized one there um yeah you can actually you know live in something pretty small i mean there are many families that that uh start out with something very little and you just kind of you say, okay, this is a temporary thing until we can build something off-grid. Um, are recycled homes long-lasting through storms, tornadoes, and such? Uh, probably not through tornadoes. <laughs> but then again, almost no house is able to survive a tornado, so... You know, I live in an area where we really don't get a lot of extreme weather other than a lot of winter. So it depends on where you live. Uh, what advice would you give to someone who wants to go do, to do off-grid in Mexico, South America? Um, get something that can, you don't really need to heat anything down there for most. I mean, there's some places in South America that does get pretty cold, I realize. But um, you'd be looking more for something that would really be able to stay cool. Um, probably something that's not made out of metal. Um, so yeah, I need to make a point here. Building prefab shed or outbuilding works well, but permanent structure. Yeah, good point. I forgot to say about that. Thank you for bringing up that point. Um, you can, people will do this thing of prefab sheds and whatever else. Um, you can get different people that make them or Lowe's sells them or things like that. And they'll get those put on their property. But then like, like she said there, you're dealing with a fixed structure, which can get you into problems. If you have a local zoning commission, that doesn't look too kindly on that. Um, what are your thoughts on people living in vans? Fine. You know, temporary. Uh, that's a good way to do it. Um, so, uh, question, how about an underground bunker? Depending on where you're at, it might make sense. Um, again, I've seen people that take a conix box and they put it down there you have to insulate it so you don't have a problem with the uh, condensation but um yeah 
it's possible you can build an underground home there's actually a book i have i don't it's out in another part of our office here it's out in our another library area and um but it's by uh, mike oler and he built an underground house for fifty dollars <laughs> back in the 1970s and things a lot of recycled materials and whatever else and it was funny because i actually saw this the story about it and um, they interviewed him and um he's dead now but they said that um, the zoning commission i guess guy said found out he was living on his property and he said i need to inspect your home and he said okay come on out you can go inspect it you know and, and the guy came out looked everywhere for the home never found it and said oh whatever just left <laughs> you know and it's pretty amazing i mean it is a real underground house so there's i've studied that as well the thing of underground housing there's some really neat stuff on that uh, the vikings used to build uh, what they called pit houses they're kind of a partial underground and above ground house um, ancient building techniques are just off the charts amazing the way people would build question do you think that there will be a nationwide power outages in the future i asked because yesterday they had one in trinidad it was really unusual and i prayed like crazy through it yeah um that's that's a big thing cybersecurity attacks and whatever else um we have been led into a dependence on a lot of different systems and it's a bad thing okay a real bad thing um yes power outages are going to be happening quite frequently in the future ultimately i believe prophetically speaking in the future it's going to be smart cities is where people will be forced to move to anything outside of that is going to be like living in the 1800s like living in a stump like that um <clears throat> question how do we dispose of black waters in other words for people that don't understand um septic things you know toilet waste and whatever else well we're talking about that in another one of the seminar parts where we talk about the thing of what to do you know the terrible toilet is what the, that one's called um so uh trying to stick with the uh thing of off-grid questions here right now question i live in south central pa when you lived there were you doing off-grid if so was it an odd odd grid friendly off-grid friendly township i don't really want want to move too far if i don't have to um there you know you have the amish there in Lancaster county and things and, and so their people are kind of used to the off off-grid concept but um we were not off-grid when we were in pennsylvania that's what we did when we came up here to maine <clears throat> um you ever looked into earth ships yes i have um another one there um we looked into land ship or, People call them land ship or earth ship. I've heard both. Recycled materials, self cooling, and building greenhouse. Yeah, really neat concept. That's another one that's really a, a cool thing. <laughs> no pun intended there, but uh, yeah, very smart way to live. Um, so, which, you know, we've been studying a lot of that stuff. I actually had a cousin that built a straw bale house. Her and her husband, they built it. And um, very easy to heat, you know the uh, r value of the straw bale walls you know 12 inch thick walls or whatever else is uh you know pretty high so it's very easy to heat so we've been looking into different ways of building on our land and whatever else eventually we haven't really done it yet we're still in the stump phase of temporary housing and um but we're really looking into you know ancient techniques of building and modern types of things that are non toxic is what we've um what we've looked into over the years how would you deal with mold it can become a big problem with humidity if there's no proper insulation yeah you have to what we do for mold if we ever have any problem with that is we just use white vinegar we don't use bleach or anything because it's toxic but um it's pretty easy to take care of it but uh yeah you have to be careful with that but see here in the north when we have winter time uh, mold's really not a problem because you have the wood stove and the humidity is really low outside and then the wood stove really dries out the air so um we i mean we're right around probably 
I don't even know, maybe 20% humidity. So it's really dry. I mean, I've seen it as low as down to 10% humidity in the winter here um, with our heating and stuff. And you actually have to be a little bit careful because if you're sleeping, your nose can start drying out, your, your mouth can dry out. If you sleep like that, you can get really dry in there. So um, composting toilets should be the norm. They work so great and easy. Yeah, we'll be talking about that in the future, but uh, yeah, um, definitely they do work. We've we've been doing um, composting toilets now for uh, probably nine years, eight or nine years, something like that. Yeah, um, they do work very well. Um, Question, any difference main versus PA? Uh, quite a few differences, yes. Um, a lot less people up here, which we like. And um, a lot colder, which we like. <laughs> um, we like Maine a lot more. Um, Pennsylvania had different types of wild edibles than Maine. Some of it is similar, but it's uh, we really have come to love uh, northern Maine. Um, So, okay, well, if there are no more questions, then I guess we will conclude this part of our of the off-grid seminar. And tomorrow, like I said, we will be dealing with laundry and hygiene, I think it is. Um, yeah, laundry and hygiene. And this is something that uh, this one we were actually doing before we, we went off-grid officially. We had a composting toilet while on grid, and we actually were doing our laundry. Uh, we had running water, but we were doing it by hand, um, the way that we would do it, the way that we've been doing it now for years. So, and I'm, I mean, you know, Oliver, we never bought one disposable diaper for him when he was a baby. It was all cloth diapers with wool soakers, and all of it was done by hand. Never had a machine, anything like that. So we'll be talking about that uh, tomorrow. I will be talking about that tomorrow. Um, going through the whole thing of you know how to stay clean, how to um, what do you do for bathing, what do you do for doing laundry. That will be tomorrow. Um, okay. Okay, I have to leave it that way. Getting rid of a troll there real quick. Sorry about that. Question, how should I know if the Lord wants me to have a dangerous life? By reading the Bible. Um, pretty much everybody in the Bible had a dangerous life. Um, danger is just part of, of living a good life. There's, a, there's an element of danger to anything. And if you want to avoid danger, well... Just not a real good life. Um, so, look at this one real quick here. There's also a lily plant that produces a soapy substance. God made everything we need. Knowledge is lost. Yeah, there's a lot of things. Uh, oh, okay, this is one I saw. This thing of soap nuts. Yeah, look into something called soap nuts. Yeah, we've actually we have those. Uh, we've tried that actually works quite well on my wife's hair she you know has very long hair um, I'm not really much of a problem I don't <laughs> not an issue to wash my hair um, beards actually longer than my head up here but uh, <laughs> there's different ways to to wash your hair without toxic um, shampoo and whatever but my wife has used soap nuts she also uses herbs herbal hair rinses and things and it works really well actually um, so but that's going to be it. We're going to end it here. Um, like I said, I'm trying to keep these about an hour long each. So tomorrow, laundry and hygiene is what we will be talking about. So um, uh, thank you to everybody out there for your support. If you could like and subscribe if you haven't subscribed. I'd like to get these videos where people can actually see them and YouTube doesn't bury it.
So if you can leave comments on the video and like the video, that would be great. And uh, we will see you tomorrow.